Thank you. Over to you now, Julian. There we go. Well, I could say thank you for all turning out on this dark, dark, <laughs> wet February evening, but as you're all sitting comfortably at home, that's perhaps not relevant. Um, starting with this rather delightful map of Oxford, uh, produced by the AUP in the 60s, a lovely 3D map, um, where the rivers are green and the hills are blue. Just think what that landscape would be like where, where it's so. Um, but there is Oxford sitting in its uh, sit, sitting amongst all the green rivers. Uh, we're going to have a bit of a romp, a romp around all over the place today. Um, oh, I, hang on, do I have to do that one? There we are. Um, partly dealing with historic towns atlas because you may or may not have seen the historical map of Oxford has been published, and now the large atlas volume has been published which you can get from Oxbow Books for a mere £56. It's a wonderful bargain. Um, and that is part of a great European project of mapping towns, uh, which at the moment Ireland is romping ahead of um, the rest of the British Isles in, in producing volumes. But we've recently done York and Winchester and Windsor, and Oxford is the latest one. And for your money, you get a book with a lot of history in it, a great map in several sheets that you stick together, um, sheets and sheets with 123 historical illustrations in, um, also a set of period maps from 1050 right through till 1800, and subsidiary maps, like a very interesting one of parish boundaries. Um, and then as well as the pictures, there are reproductions of historic maps. So at last you can get your hands on a decent copy of Logan and um, the Ho Hogarth view of Oxford 1850 and the map you probably haven't many of you seen, which is a 1769 map of Port Meadow. So there's a great stack of historic maps as well. And then the map, the map itself it is a map of the town at the same date as the first Ordnance Survey map but with missing buildings added onto it. So here we have the, um, the friaries in St. Ebbs, um, a lot, which have gone uh, ages ago alongside the gas works, which went slightly more recently. Um, and that's a wonderful, great detailed map. that You can sort of stick all the sheets together. And I say that one is also reproduced as a single folding map you can buy. Well, maps of towns, maps of cities are great fun. And Burton in The Anatomy of Melancholy re um, recommends looking at maps and atlases for making one happy and joyful as one ranges across the world. Um, and indeed, the great um, Cities of the World Atlas by Brown and Hogenberg is the most marvellous snapshot of all the great cities of Europe. And we see just how different they all are. Uh, Someone like Amsterdam, very obviously, depending on all its waters, uh, and canals and, the, and its harbours. Um, the city of Bergen in, in Norway, uh, almost entirely a timber city, um, a, a great wooden city, no, no doubt a lot of stave building. Um, a whole character of a place like that has totally changed since, since the 16th century. And there are other maps of great towns, uh, places like Bruges, and one thing you can oft, so often do with a map is even just looking at it yourself can determine some of the development of a town. Now, Bruges is very well illustrated in art. It's got an incredible number of surviving buildings. Um, a bit like Venice, it determined quite early on to become an, an historic place that people would visit. So some buildings have become even more historic than they were. But you can enjoy yourself in the town working out where its original uh, ex what its original extent was, the sort of defended centre with, with the moat round it, uh, the later medieval walls that were added onto it, and then the huge defences going round that, uh, the kind of defences that so often in European cities um, have become ring roads and boulevards. Um, and it's this kind of map analysis is, is one of the things that's um, amusing to do if you're visiting somewhere. Um, or if you're in Paris, you can have fun discovering the remains of the collegiate university, because before they were all chucked into the Sorbonne, um, Paris was a collegiate university. Um, and there's a lovely map of Paris in the 14th century you can get, uh, which shows all the 
uh, university and college buildings on the South Bank, um, opposite the Royal Palace and Church of Notre Dame in the centre. Um, I did have a occasion once to go to Moscow in search of the great English coach that's kept there in the Kremlin. Um, and Moscow is an extremely interesting place with its Kremlin at the centre, which is a huge, um, a huge palace. Now, does the, will the laser point, can you see that? The Kremlin is there, which is like the walled centre, and it has next to it the sort of medieval town there. And then, as you can see, two further extensions beyond. So the Kremlin at the centre has the palaces and the cathedrals. And what is interesting about the early maps is they show in that part of the town, uh, one of the named buildings in the Blau Atlas is the, um, the Hall of the English Merchants of the Muscovy Company. And the Muscovy Company had a base, is the reason they took the coach to, to, to Boris Godunov. They had a base in near the Kremlin, um, in Vavarka Street, St. Barbara's Street. And astonishingly, that has survived. And it is a museum you can vi visit, the English Court Museum, which was rediscovered, buried inside a, an 18th century block of flats and rescued by a very brave man who stood up to the authorities and said this must be preserved. And you can go and visit that today as the, um, as the English Court Museum, which celebrates English trade with Russia. Now, if you haven't been there recently or you don't think it's very exciting, you have to make your way up to the top floor of the British Museum, because there in the um, <clears throat> in the edge of the print room is this great map of Venice in 1500, uh, which is about six foot long. It's an absolutely huge map uh, from various sheets fitted together. Uh, one of a series of maps, um, all of which, given the character of Venice, tend to show some of its character. But this one in particular uh, is utterly amazing. And you can, you, the parts of the city, you can still use it for getting round. Uh, it's one of the first great maps, the 3D maps, that shows buildings, individual buildings and places, uh, and shows the buildings in such detail you can recognise them. Um, it doesn't, of course, show all the complexities of Venice, uh, that bewildering series of parishes and small islands that eventually form the city. Um, and Venice is very much in need of an historic town's atlas to explain quite how it came to into being. But um, I just to remind you, this, this map was engraved in 1500. Um, all the other maps we have, uh, you know, 50 years later. Um, so you have in glorious detail, um, St. Mark's and the, and, and the Doge's Palace. And then further over is the Arsenal, where you can actually see all the boats in their sheds and the boats being built. Um, in, in spectacular um, 3D detail, which is, I say, you can see that in the British Museum. It's quite easy to go and find. And another town I've been involved with um, is a town called Geen, which you probably, you'll not be familiar with unless you've been there. Uh, you will be familiar with Calais, which is over there on the horizon. You may have, without re realising it, have driven past the castle of Ham um, across this great flooded landscape. And this is the famous view in Hampton Court, the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which is over there. And that was outside the town of Guine, which is part of the English, um, the English lordship of Calais, which is about 80 square miles in France. It's actually a bit of Kent across the sea because the down, Kent down just carries on under the channel. Um, and to give the game away in advance, the complication of this picture, uh, which is assumed to be slightly fantastic, is that it's looking two ways. It's looking back to Calais, which is to the northwest, and it's looking out to the field of the cloth of gold, which is to the southeast. Um, and in the middle of that, we have the castle. And this is the famous scene showing Henry VIII arriving at the field of the cloth of gold. 
And the great puzzle is where was that castle? And the, there's an astonishing um, series of documents that allow us to discover where that was, um, including a, um, a Portuguese map of Guine, which shows the castle and the defenses, um, a very large map of Calais and the Pale, which has got details of all the individual castles, and the earliest English measured plan, which is a survey of the walls, a measured survey of the town walls of Guine, uh, again showing the keep of the castle and parts of the castle there. Now the castle itself has completely disappeared. Uh, there's just the um, there's just the mot left and the Grand Place on the site of the Great Bailey. And the town walls have disappeared largely, apart from this circuit round here. Um, they can partly be seen on the cadastre, which is the sort of French equivalent of a tide map, the early 19th century town surveys. Um, but it's only by looking at all these maps together that you can gradually put together the plan of the town, uh, which is particularly helped not only by the cadastre and its depiction of the sort of moat around the castle, but also a wonderful sort of office of works plan. And this is one of the ones in the cotton series in the British, uh, British Library now. Um, there's, there's a measured plan of the castle, there's pictorial plans of the castle. There's an astonishing number of 16th century views of bits of Calais and the castles there. And if you put all these together, uh, which are helped by key French excavation, which located the outer walls, you can reconstruct the town walls and the medieval town, you can reconstruct the castle with its moats, and you can understand what's happening in the picture. Because what the picture depicts is Henry having come across land from Calais, entering the town through one gate. He can't get into the castle because it's cut off by a moat. So he has to come out of the town wall there through a little wooden gate, walk around the edge of the castle, um, and come into the castle gate that way. And as he turns left to go into the castle, the temporary palace is on its, his right. And that means that if we put this onto the map, we put that route onto the map, the temporary castle can only be there. Um, and when you consider that the temporary castle, although built of timber and canvas, was almost the size of Christchurch Tom Quad, uh, which just fits onto that. Um, just fits onto that island there. Um, but that's rather an amusing piece of working through a whole stack of historic maps to, to find out what's going on. And just as a joker in the pack, there is a map of New Amsterdam. Um, and there are the, which is the bottom end of um, Manhattan today. And there is Wall Street with the wall running down it. Um, just at the bottom end of, of Manhattan. And of course, the American colonies have got lots of early maps produced by English map makers. Anyway, we're now going to look at some, coming back to England, we're going to look at towns and compare some of the ones where we've got good sources for the medieval town and the topography. And interestingly, these sort of break down into a fairly small number of towns that have got really abundant property records. Um, so places like Oxford and Cambridge with colleges that have kept records, uh, Canterbury and Winchester, where you've got cathedrals and other bodies with good records, um, and very big, rich places like Southampton and Bristol with a lot of landowners, a lot of corporate landowners, um, do, do pretty well for understanding what's going on inside a town. Other places, one is not quite so sure, places like Salisbury or Lincoln, may have very good records for a single body, but there aren't enough bodies to sort of fill up the map. And other places have very good single sources. So I'll be showing you a rental of Hull. Ludlow has a famous, Ludlow and Gloucester have famous rentals. And all the Thames Valley monastic towns, including Abingdon, Newbury and Reading, had surveys done by Roger Amis at the time of the dissolution. So there are house by house surveys of those towns, um, which they sort of been studied in part, but they, they really are, they deserve to be to be published. So let's have a look at some of these places. Um, 
and first of all, Cambridge and Oxford, which are the such obvious comparisons of towns, well, unique towns <laughs> that have a, a historic in England that have an historic university in them. Um, and Oxford, where the university has all ended up over the east side of the town, and Cambridge, believe it, leaving the commercial town on the west, um, and Cambridge, where the university has actually swallowed up some of the, the, the important parts of the town that are on the riverfront, uh, but leaving a, a vibrant market town on the other side. But we can ignore what Baedeker has to say about Oxford and Cambridge. But one of the interesting differences in Oxford and Cambridge is that Oxford has studied its history enormously um, and Cambridge has rather given up. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't agree to this at all. They've rather given up since the great works of Willis and Clark. And, and Willis was the engineering professor who um, produced the great, well, a lot of, he invented the archeology span of buildings in his great studies of cathedrals and also turned his attention to the history of Cambridge. And his architectural history, which was finished off by his uh, nephew or steps, um, son-in-law, uh, Clark, has an atlas volume that shows all the college buildings. And when you lift the tissue paper covering, you get the medieval properties on the site. So he did actually map out for the collegiate areas, a lot of the historic properties. But I have yet to see anyone has turned this into a map of, Cam a map of medieval Cambridge. Uh, people have written about Cambridge, they've published about Cambridge, they've published extensive documents of the fields of Cambridge, but I have yet to see a map of medieval Cambridge um, that makes anything of the, um, the astonishing work that um, Willis and Clark did well over a century ago. Of course, some people don't do maps at all. And uh, for Ramsey, which is a very, very special uh, medieval town, because it was on an island in the middle of the great watery wastes of the Fenland, um, here is a classic example of an historian's map. Um, and some historians just don't do maps. And this excellent book on the history of Ramsey um, treats it as if in map terms, treats it as if it was sort of on Mars or sitting on a piece of polystyrene, uh, because there it is in a great waste of gray, which doesn't show the, the islands, the place, its relation to Whittlesey, Whittlesey Mere, and all the major routeways, the transport routes that actually cross the Fens, which is the reason that, that, that Ramsey is there. So that's an unusual example of mapping and history being, geography being ignored. Um, Canterbury is a nice example where there are abundant records and um, much work has been done on them. This is a map of Canterbury in 1200. And it's one of a series of historic maps of Canterbury that have been published. And that is based on the work of William Urry, who I was lucky enough to um, have as my paleography teacher many years ago. And he produced a great map of Canterbury based on the 12th century rentals. Uh, and this particular bit of the map actually shows the route of the knights going to murder Becket um, as they went into the um, they went into the hall to look for the archbishop and then gave up and went through the cloister, uh, went to the chapter house and eventually found him there where they, where they murdered him. Um, and the wonderful thing about Bill Urry was not only could he draw maps of it, but he could tell you the whole story as if he had been there. You know, he actually knew the Lambert Fries, the money of, or the person who was, whose, fire, who'd, um, whose furnace had set fire to the cathedral. He knew these people personally um, and could bring their histories to life. And there's a later map of Canterbury in 1500. As I said, it's a series of historic maps they've produced, and they've also now got an historic map in the new series and are thinking about doing an atlas. Well, the, the, the single city where there has been a great achievement in this sort of study is Winchester, where Derek Keane, um, under the inspiration of Billy Pantin and all Salter's work in Oxford, produced a major survey of Winchester in two volumes, a house by house survey accompanied by period maps um, for, for different parts of Winchester. Though interestingly, Derek Keane was so aware 
of how uncertain a lot of this was and how much it changed, that he was unwilling to produce a map of medieval Winchester um, in the Oxford sense that, that could have appeared in the Atlas. But on the other hand, he produced a lot of analyses of different kinds of properties. So the estates of individual rich um, citizens in the medieval period and these seven great fiefs that are recorded in 1148. Um, it's essentially these early rentals, they're like a doomsday book of Winchester uh, that recorded the landholders um, and specifically said where their landholding was. So you have a unique opportunity actually to plot out ownership of individual people. Well, Derek Keane went on to work on London and produced a historical gazetteer of London, which very unfortunately was produced as a sort of microfiche edition, um, which was difficult to get hold of then, um, and it's even harder to get hold of now, because although the text has been released, um, the copyright and the plans have been re um, reserved. So it's very difficult to use this in the way that it was intended. Uh, but as the beginning of a great London study, um, a series of parishes in the centre of London were studied in huge detail. Um, and the gazetteer, like the Winchester one, produces the entire history, the entire documented history of, of every single site in, in that area. Moving down to Southwark, there's an outline gazetteer was produced by Martha Carlin, uh, slightly easier to an extent because a lot of the properties in Southwark were inns going down the Borough High Street. Um, it's just in after in after in. Um, and that's one of the things that helps reconstruct topography when you can, it's clear who's living where and who's living next door. You can sort of piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle. Work has been done on Bristol by Roger Leach, where he's done a survey based on the, and this one actually goes right forward from the medieval period to modern times and has reconstructed a lot of the, um, the properties in Bristol and at the same time has produced a magnificent book on all the houses in Bristol. So he's sort of, he's done both the properties and the, and, and the buildings. Coventry is also well documented. The Priory Register gives a lot of information, uh, which Nat Alcock and others have worked on, but they've been rather reluctant actually to put their properties onto the map. And the easiest map is the, um, is the big one to 500 survey, the large scale, 10 foot to a mile survey of the late Victorian era, which very often preserves medieval boundaries. But they've chosen in Coventry to leave those, their maps as diagrammatic. Um, there similarly was a great um, project at one time to work on Norwich, though sadly with the death of Helen Sutermeister, this was never completed. Um, it's got similar records like Winchester, uh, these great rolls of um, enrolled title deeds, which meant that properties could be reconstructed. And some of the areas were mapped, and then sort of one publication came out, um, but Norwich is still a city that, that awaits, um, awaits students. Whereas Southampton, a huge amount has been done on the records of God's House, some of which are in Queen's College, Oxford, um, and effectively between the various cartularies, there is a tenement survey of medieval Southampton. Uh, York, however, is a bit disappointing. Uh, some things have been mapped, uh, some of the individual fiefs around the town um, and individual properties within the town, um, but still no one has undertaken the great task of producing a, a survey of York. And then coming to the towns with a single document at Gloucester, there's this lovely rental that goes down the street telling you who lives on either side of the road with little pictures of some of the buildings. And that has been subject to analyses of property values and the location of different properties. So these are sort of spot, spot locations rather than um, giving the shape of the tenements. Likewise at Hull, there's a, um, a fee farm rental of the town's properties which has allowed the, the medieval town to be re reconstructed. And famously at Win Winchelsea, which is a delightful mathematical problem, where there's the original charter setting out the new town of Winchelsea, uh, which is now gone, it's just a green field. Um, 
but the properties are given by their area. And someone very cleverly worked out how these areas could be interpreted. So the plan of Winchelsea is somewhat hypothetical, but, but I think it works. Um, and they reconstructed the whole medieval town. And um, David and Barbara Martin have done analyses on that. They've also been involved in excavating some of the properties. And in, in Winchelsea, although the, the town is gone, there are still churches and there are still cellars. Um, so quite a lot could be found out about it, um, even though um, so much has gone. And then some towns sort of defy, um, De defy research into their early period because they don't have sufficient records. So Kendall in Westmoreland, uh, which has got um, a lot of information about its topography and its setting that you can get from later maps. It is a classic town laid out on a, a sort of single street town with long properties going down to the river. Uh, uh, characteristic actually, it shares with Kilkenny, which is on the right there. Um, and yet it's very difficult to work out any of the histories of those properties before the 16th and 17th centuries. And then the, the place I've worked on at Porchester in Hampshire, which is ludicrously over documented. Um, it had a mad canon who produced library catalogues, um, edited the court rolls, produced itineraries of all the pre monster retention houses, indexed the cartridges and made lots of lists of things like tables and seat numbers. Um, did a survey of Porchester and walked up one side of the, this, it's a small town, and he walked up one side of the street and came down the other side. And then he went through the fields, starting at the top left-hand corner. And in every field, he tells you which way the strips go, and whether they go north, south, and he walks through the entire field system. And although we don't have a map for that, I've reconstructed a sort of hypothetical map of Porchester. Um, but that's a very rare example where someone who is obviously completely bonkers um, has done a sort of mega, you know, a, 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 a mega survey of, of what's there and also produced another series of documents which locks it all together with the families in the court hold. So finally we get to Oxfordshire um, and back in the 70s we produced a survey of the historic towns in Oxfordshire. Um, and as was appropriate in the 70s, that included Berkshire. So it had all the Berkshire towns, um, like having done Wallingford, which I'm not going to talk about today. And um, what that tried to do was to analyze the topography of the town, the sort of salient features of the historic town, and also um, try to date the buildings. And I was involved in doing this in several of the towns where we walked around looking at them from the outside and a lot of guesswork and using pre-existing information, tried to work out if buildings were um, pre-17, pre pre like medieval, pre-1750, 1750 to 1840, and 1840 to 1914, um, which does give a sort of general idea of the number of historic buildings in the towns. And this, there's lots of other surveys being done in towns. So there's a thing called the Extended Urban Survey, but none of these other surveys have actually quite replaced what this one did um, in, in its looking at the, the buildings and the topography together. Though lots of other work has happened. At Banbury, uh, there is that one of the early volumes, of this, the original volume of the Historic Towns Atlas contained Banbury. Um, and there is its cross, which Paul Harvey had decided of the various sites of the cross, the Banbury Cross must be there in the marketplace. Um, it's a town that sits on the through road, the Banbury Road, which passes by, and at the same time, the other crossroads meeting at the marketplace, and had a huge castle, um, which tragically has disappeared in a series of 20th and 21st century developments. Um, despite extensive e excavations um, from the 70s right through to the late 1990s, which recovered the general character of the castle um, as a double-moated double enceinte. And at the centre of that was the original um, Bishop's Castle, because Banbury, like Tame, belonged to the Bishops of Lincoln. Um, 
but any opportunities for displaying that or preserving it in a meaningful way have sadly been lost and much of it has been destroyed. But Banbury has the distinction of being the subject of a famous article called the Banburys of England, which is of towns that never quite made it to being a big regional centre, never quite made it to being a big market town, never quite became a sort of proper borough, um, chartered borough, but were still quite important places in their, their mini regions. Um, and if Banbury is now most famous for its, um, its cake and its cross, um, it nevertheless has obviously had a role in, in North Oxfordshire and its own local region. A Chipping Norton, which is currently the subject of uh, the next Victoria County history volume, and there's been a fair amount of work on the topography of the town, which of course includes a castle up at that end by the church, and a fairly clear set of long, very long tenements there. Tenements is just the word for the, the properties. The long tenement plots on that side, uh, varied tenement plots in the middle, and other blocks of properties over here, and then going off down the street. Um, and a back lane, which these towns very often have when, when they've been laid out with properties. And clearly in Chipping Norton, there's a mixture of the place that was there with its castle and its church and its marking place, which has then grown by adding on other, um, adding on other extended bits, either planned or just organic growth. And in Chipping Norton, there are a large number of pre-1700 properties. Um, and this is, this is one of the interesting things about the towns is it's absolutely variable as to whether early properties survive or not. You get places like Ludlow that are just chock full of medieval houses. Um, and others may not have any at all. Um, I mean, Oxford's only got about five medieval houses, believe it or not. Um, and Norwich has almost none above ground. They have great fires that burnt them out. Anyway, Chipping Norton has a fair number, including the most wonderful building of all, which is, well, it's either a wool shop or a tavern, but it's sort of sunk half below the ground like, like taverns, uh, but had windows and a front door and a fireplace. So it was rather a grand establishment. Um, it was always rather difficult to see by going through a trap door and a shop. I'm not sure if that's changed. Um, Burford, poor old Burford is a classic, just like Dorchester later on. It was a classic town that got bypassed. So the old road used to go down into the town and everybody went there and came out the other side. Uh, the coach road, the turnpike road bypassed it on the top of the hill um, and Burford went to sleep. Uh, which is why it's preserved lots of wonderful buildings. Um, and worse still, bef even before that, the miserable Lords of the Manors had cancelled the, the, the borough. The Lord of the Manor just said, oh, we're not going to have a borough. And they meekly gave in and handed over the charters and handed over their seal. So it had even ceased to be a proper borough, which is terribly sad. But it's had a nice book written about it by the, um, the VCH crew and others. And that involves a study of the buildings in town. And in particular, a study of the, um, the tenement plots, because Burford is a sort of ladder. It's a ladder town with long tenements going all the way either side of the road, all the way down the street. And these have been analysed in terms of their size and whether they fit a three perch. Uh, there seems to be a three perch mode in one street and a two, four perch or two, three perch mode in the other street um, and you can see properties that have perhaps been amalgamated or subdivided from an original notional layout of the town and also you can analyze that um, into areas that are thought to be primary secondary and then added on later um, and people do love drawing circles around early churches uh, there's a sort of circular bit at the top which may be an original um, Anglo-Saxon phase um, and then add-ons in phase two and carrying on into the 13th century. 13th century was a great phase of planned towns and adding bits onto towns. So um, Ensham and Whitney both have new towns that are added on, sort of new, new sorry, new lands that, that are added on 
when they, when they build extra extra properties. And a study by Lathwaite many years ago uh, had a look at all the houses. A lot more work has been done since then. And of course, one of the peculiarities of Burford is having these very long tenement plots. You often get long, narrow properties with yards going behind. Um, and there are some very fine medieval houses here surviving, quite a lot of timber framing, and a mixture of surviving houses, houses that have been rebuilt, and houses that have merely been refronted. Um, but in all, on Lathwaite's count, there were as many as 30 houses pre-1550. Um, that count probably changed since then, but um, and a majority of them predated 1700. Um, and that may, I think, partly be because the, um, the, the road was diverted away from the town and it wasn't a big thriving place in the 19th century. But these marketplaces are always very important, uh, particularly for the wool towns, um, this is a, a plot from that book showing the size of the marketplaces. And when we come to Whitney, there's an absolute monster marketplace coming all the way down towards the church. I and mean, only this bit is now the marketplace. But there's another great open green area coming down to the church. And actually, there's a green area beyond the church, which is possibly where the fair was held, because towns, if they had a market, also had a, had a fair, which was where sort of wholesaling went on. Um, and Whitney is a very grand place founded by the bishops of Winchester, who were extremely rich, and they had their palace here. Um, but it's a slightly odd town because it's as if the new town has been pushed into what's already there, because you've got a Curbridge on one side, you've got Haley on the other, both of which have their own sets of fields. Though Whitney must have had some fields up in this area. And of course, the bishop had a park. So there's Park, Whitney Park Farm must represent the, well, they think the boundary of the medieval park is there. It may well have been larger. Um, so there's a whole landscape there. And then of course, on the other side, you've got Cogs, which has got its own fields and arrangement. It's got a little priory and had a castle. Um, so these towns always, they always have quite a complicated landscape and all these towns needed some sort of fields and they certainly needed hay meadows for their, for their horses. But what Whitney did have, of course, was a great Winchester church. And also, to everyone's surprise, just hidden behind the church was the, um, the great palace at Mount House, which was partly excavated and uh, remains still visible. You can go and see them. And of course, there's the um, interesting attempts to relate what was dug up to what is shown in the 18th century in a drawing of what is. Um, what is that ruin? Woodstock, perhaps less exciting, um, but Woodstock was a little new town made to service the great palace in the park, uh, not Vanbrugh's palace, but the medieval palace, uh, which sat opposite on the other side of the bridge. Um, and and that, interesting, that's only illustrated by plot because he's showing the echo. There by the town gate, there are people standing on the slope. Um, and at that time, the echo repeated off the hills around. Um, and if you go to, if you have, if you're bold enough, you can go to Blenheim and try that echo today. It still works, though perhaps not as excitingly as it did um, before the lake. And then, of course, Tame, um, another town of the bishops of Winchester, and famous created, famously created by diverting the road to the church into the marketplace. So instead of passing through the town to the church and out the other side, you're diverted into the great marketplace. Um, and there's another town with huge, um, a huge series of long burgage plots and back lanes on either side. And Dorchester, which is um, a sort of mini Oxford, it sits between the Thames and the Tame, um, and Dorchester is there and it has its North Oxford fields up there and is surrounded by meadows. Uh, of course, the centre of the town is the Roman town of Dorchester and the, Anglo the site of the Anglo-Saxon cathedral. So it's very much a sort of minor town, um, but in Roman times was um, one of the few towns in Oxford sitting on a Roman road. And then going further down the river, we come to Henley, 
and that has been the subject of a Victoria County history, large volume and small volume, um, and a lot of work there that Robert Peabody has done on the history of the town and river. Um, and I'm sure you all have in your library a copy of that famous book by the Emperor of Japan, The Thames as Highway, a study of navigation and traffic on the upper Thames in the 18th century. Um, rather difficult to get hold of book, but very interesting. Um, and you can see immediately looking at that plan that Henley has got a whole series of blocks with tenements, long tenement plots in it. And that has been, oh, where's my plan gone? Um, sorry, it dropped out. That has been analyzed into a sort of an earlier area, earlier area up here and a block of large block of medieval new town here. Um, centered on the bridge. Um, but again, like these other ones, it, it's a sort of theoretical analysis, which one would have to show over the long term with archaeology. But the key thing of, of Henley, as Robert Peabody has shown, is its position on the Thames, um, and a Thames that used flash locks, where you basically opened a gate, and when the river was safe enough, you, you rushed through it on the downflow of water. And Henley was the most convenient point below the series of flash locks on the Upper Thames and was the link between the Chiltern Hills and London, um, primarily for things like firewood. Um, and the Chilterns and Henley were the great suppliers of fuel to London. Um, and that's always a key factor of urban geography is where on earth did they get their fuel from? Um, so flowing down the river, you go through the flash locks, coming up the river, you have to be dragged, and if you don't have horses, you have people dragging you up the river, um, sometimes at no, more, no faster than a snail's pace. Um, and that, of course, is from the Luttrell Psalter in the early 14th century. And Henley, which has illustrated that famous and wonderful couple of pictures by Seabrecht, um, very much was a sort of port town with buildings and things along the riverfront that related to its trades, and there are medieval buildings there, which probably belong to that enterprise. So to come back to mapping Oxford, this is the, um, this is our new, ah, oh, this, this is edition one of our map. We have a, this is the second edition that's just come out and is used in the Atlas as one or two things that have changed. Um, but this is the map of Oxford from the Atlas showing the walled center from the castle in the west to over to Magdalen Bridge in the east. And Oxford has lots of historic maps. It's got the Agus map uh, here in an 18th century reprinting that showed the town in 1578. And he was then copied by Logan, David Logan, who drew Oxford from the same, um, the same direction. And this map, is simply that the finest, it's the finest city map produced anywhere in Europe. It shows in incredible detail um, everything that was happening in Oxford, uh, wells, bowling greens, gardens, sheds at the bottom of gardens, and is almost flawless. Um, I've, I have found two mistakes on it, which I won't bother you with now, um, but it is just wonderful for showing you things like all the back gardens, in, in St Giles, showing the ditches that used to be in everyone's front gardens in St Giles. Um, it's a very, very wonderful map that you can look at and find constant delight and information in. So Oxford's got early maps. It's also got an incredible number of early drawings of buildings and streets that have disappeared, um, famously ones done by the Butler, father and son, um, who pretty much covered, well, they pretty much covered all the streets that have lost their houses, and which one day we can use to reconstruct a sort of house by house view of Oxford. On the documentary side, um, we owe a huge amount to the Reverend H.E. Salter, um, <clears throat> who probably with almost no encouragement whatsoever from any academic historian in Oxford um, until his later years, produced about 35 volumes of medieval records of Oxford Town and University, uh, produced a map of medieval Oxford, and 
which was published in 1934, uh, where showing Oxford at no particular date, he just showed the presence of every single known medieval property in the town. He worked on original documents. So this, for example, is the original charter by which Jacob, son of Moses, sold his house to Merton College, uh, written in Latin with a Hebrew subscription. And there are uh, charters and other properties. The colleges have deeds. They have rentals of their properties. And the colleges had post-medieval leases of their properties. So for Magdalen and Christchurch, he was able to go back um, from the maps in the medieval leases, back to the rentals, back to the deeds, to plot out the properties. And then a key source was a 1772 paving survey, um, which gives the measurements of every house. And then there's a survey of Oxford in 1279 that lists all the properties in Oxford. So there are some key serial listings of houses, um, which apart from Hollywell and St Aldate's are relatively easy to use. And as he worked, he kept a notebook and his survey of Oxford is sometimes misunderstood as being a sort of completed survey. It is simply a notebook of what he knew about properties. So sometimes if he published stuff, it's not in his notebook, um, but they're a starting point, an incredibly important starting point for understanding Oxford properties. And so just to take one example of the Crown Inn in Corn Market, and this is that um, 19th century map I was talking about, the 1 to 500 Ordnance Survey map, um, which shows things like glass houses, pumps, trees, doorsteps. Um, that is the outline of the Crown Inn in 1875. This is the Crown Inn shown on a lease at University College. Um, and that is it shown on a more modern map, <clears throat> by which time St Martin's Church has gone, the properties have all been rebuilt on, on a new alignment. So by hopping from map to map, you can um, follow something of what's happening. And then the other thing the 1875 map does is that for institutions, it shows all the interiors. Um, now, there were two versions of the map. One of them didn't show the prison. There's a big white gap. The other one does show the prison. Uh, but for things like County Hall and all the colleges and all public buildings, um, this map does show um, interiors. So that's a bit of Salter's map for the Northeast Ward, covering uh, Jesus College, Lincoln College, Exeter College. And you see there's a distinction between the hard lines where he knew the measurements of the property and the dotted lines where he didn't. Um, and this sheet of the map was drawn by Miss Walker, which has very neat handwriting. The other bits were done by Salter with his own handwriting. Just occasionally he did analyses of these maps. So on the site of the Angel Inn, which is now the examination schools, he showed how the large number of medieval properties on Logic Lane and Kybald Street gradually got amalgamated into larger properties and then which then disappeared altogether um, with University College on the one side and more Magdalen on the other taking over some of those properties which leaves Logic Lane with its illogical kink in the middle because it was once a crossroads um, but that's almost the only example where Salter actually sort of worked through the history of some of his properties um, he did publish in the first well, well, the first modern volume of Victoria County history, he published a single map showing the academic halls. Again, not at any particular date, um, but just showing the ones he'd identified, which is part of what he had been doing in working on the history of the properties. Now, I myself did a similar exercise for the history of the university about 30 years ago, um, and that map has been incorporated in our period map of Oxford in 1400. So this shows in brownie gray, all the academic halls um, alongside the actual colleges like Merton, Oriel, and Canterbury College. And it shows in blue, the inns. Um, and as far as we can see in 1279, there weren't any inns in Oxford. 
um, by 1400, there are 21 inns. They'd appeared in the early 14th century, as they did in London, as they did in Southwark. Um, and they rather neatly plot the sort of commercial end of Oxford, with the university very much developing on that side of Oxford and down there. Um, but Oxford on the main streets, there were inns on the main streets. And at this date, only University College had actually hit the high street. Um, otherwise, the high street would have looked like a, an ordinary town street if you'd passed through it. And that's just to show you some of the detail of that map um, where we've tried to show in 1400 the individual uses. And that also includes the schools of the university um, and the parish churches, as well as the colleges. And in the case of someone like Canterbury College, the missing buildings of the college and the former Queen's College um, before it was rebuilt in the 18th century. And the next map in that series is Oxford in 1500. Um, and this one shows college properties. Um, again, um, something that I plotted for the, well, it was plotted in some detail for the history of the university, but here summarized in 1500, um, by which time, uh, Magdalen College had acquired the Hospital of St John with all its properties. So these are all the properties of New College, All Souls, Merton, Oriel, Exeter, Queens, Univ, um, plus Magdalen College. And if you added on the properties of Osney Abbey, that would take another chunk of properties out. So Oxford had a very skewed land market by the late medieval period. With, it, with a huge amount of property having disappeared into the dead hand of the church, as it's called, or indeed the dead hand of the colleges. And only a tiny amount actually belonged to the university. So that's the beginning of our series of, well, almost the beginning of our series of period maps is Oxford in 1150, um, where really we're working back from what we know later on. And we don't certainly know the location of all these minor streams. We know that one because it's the Shire Lake, which is very important. Um, we assume these mills and mill streams were there because they're there later, but we don't absolutely know exactly where they were at, at that date. And part of the answers to these questions comes from the archaeology and the very large, um, vast number of excavations that have taken place. And these just the ones really by, um, this was done for the anniversary of the Oxford Archaeological Unit um, and others, of course, then and since have carried out other excavations and observations, of course, these aren't all proper digs. And this work has transformed our understanding of Oxford. We now know that there's a Henge monument on the site of Keeble College uh, that was dug by um, Thames Valley for St John's. We always knew there were barrows on the site of Radcliffe, but the Museum of London discovered them there. And Robert Plott told us that in the 17th century that there were crop marks in the university parks. Uh, we haven't dug those up yet, but um, there's a large, there's a ritual landscape there of a henge with other barrows and burials around it, which is very interesting. And archeology span has told us a huge amount about the waterways in Oxford. Um, and there's been a, quite a lot of work done on the line of the um, so-called flood relief channel, uh, which has revealed more of the archaeology down there. And this is the LIDAR mapping that's been done, um, which isn't very helpful for areas of buildings, but with areas that have got trees on them, are very useful at showing you the landform. Um, and over the last 50 years, a vast amount has been discovered about the history of the Thames, the changing history of the Thames, so somewhere down like at Folly Bridge, um, there's Grand Pont coming down to Folly Bridge. We now understand that things like the Trill Mill Stream, which are now a sort of narrow stream, were once a much broader river channel. And a lot of these channels and islands have come and gone, um, partly as a result of all the Iron Age and Roman farming in the upper Thames that has thrown a lot of alluvium down the rivers, um, causing flooding and changes. Um, and that's somewhere the archaeology of Oxford has particularly contributed to that and understanding how people lived next to the waterways and they gradually got controlled. 
And more recently, we've hugely advanced our understanding of Oxford Castle, which was always a rather secret and inaccessible place, um, known from historic mapping. Um, and this map puts together two maps, Taylor's map of 1750 and Fadden's of 1789, which conveniently shows you how New Road was cut through the castle and gives you the site of the old Shire Hall um, and the appearance of the, the castle buildings, sorry, the prison buildings inside the castle. The castle is recorded by Agus. Um, it's a pictorial view that's not hugely helpful. Uh, there's an incredible detailed map and series of surveys done for Christchurch's lawsuit with the city. Uh, Christchurch bought the castle from the Crown and then immediately got into a lawsuit with the city about what it had actually bought. Um, and there's lots of depositions that describe the topography of the castle. There are views of the castle in the 18th century, a very helpful Burgers view done for Thomas Hearn, uh, which shows the old sh the ruins of the Shire Hall there and the road that used to go through past the jail. The lovely Michelangelo Rooker viewed just after New Road had been built <clears throat> and showing not walls, but trees, uh, felled trees and the gravel digging that was prevalent all over the site. And then of course, the wonderful drawings by Melchior and in one of his Corpus Christi sketchbooks, there are some superb views of here looking down Tidmarsh Lane and here looking along the site of New Road, um, which is just about to be cut through the bottom of the mott and the trees sitting in the ditch on the other side of the road. And, but it's the excavations carried out recently that have finally put some of these features on the map. Um, and we are beginning to understand where the castle is. Though actually recent work up here and over there on the other side of the, of the river, uh, already changing our view of what the castle was and where it was. And we're revising our views of the size and extent of the city ditch. Then Beaumont Palace, um, shown here in a view looking down Beaumont Street, um, when the last remnants were taken away for building the north side of Beaumont Street, it's another site that was frequently drawn and um, recorded by early artists. But it's slightly difficult to work out where it is. We can see where Beaumont was because that is the estate that was developed as Beaumont Street and St John Street. And it's shown on the St Giles Parish map as being a couple of enclosures. Um, but apart from that, the chapel, as it was called, the sites of none of the buildings are known for certain. Though the early views and descriptions of the, the Whitefriars buildings that were taken over from the Royal Palace suggest that they were all down at the west end of Beaumont Street. And we know that burials were found in this area in the 19th century. Um, and we discovered remains of tree planting there under the, um, if it's still called that, the Sackler Library um, and the remains of a building nearby. But Beaumont Palace still remains something of a mystery. Whereas another great lost building like Ruley Abbey, uh, recorded in huge detail in a series of drawings by Burgers uh, for Hearn, um, has revealed itself. The last bit of that structure um, survived until the railway came. The house at the top end there, this is looking up past the far end, far station towards Ruley Abbey. <clears throat> and a lovely William Turner drawing that's recently come back to Oxford. And a series of excavations done for the railway and the side business school, um, located in a somewhat unsatisfactory way, the outline of those buildings. But unfortunately, there were only ever these sort of trial trenches to see what was there. So nothing was fully opened up. Um, and although very wickedly a, a, a road was built through the scheduled monument, which never should have been built, um, most of that site is now preserved in the garden of the, um, of the side business school. And it's just a tragedy. They never saw the potential in redigging the moat and having a nice water garden. But there we are. It's very difficult for archeologists to um, persuade developers that something is fun and worth doing. And there's a reconstruction of what it was like 
Um, and it's a building of particular interest because it was an abbey, it was founded as an abbey and a college. It was founded as a place of study for Cistercian students. So its precise plan form is something of interest. And there it is represented on the atlas. And likewise with Osney Abbey, which we only have a sort of shady notion of where it was. Um, it's where you stop, when the train stops outside the station, you're, if you're on the right part of the train, you're on the um, above the high altar of um, Osney Abbey. But for other sites like the Trinitarian Friars down in Rose Lane, we simply don't know what was there at all. The Grey Friars and the Black Friars have been fully excavated and we know where they are. At least we thought we did in the 1960s and 70s when the Grey Friars were dug. Um, but recently the massive excavation of the Westgate car park, which had actually preserved most of the archeology span underneath it, uh, was able to look again at the buildings of the Greyfriars coming down to the Trill Mill stream um, and crossing over to the other side. And that is the top end of the cloister. So in the 1960s, we found the church, which is up here, which is under Sainsbury's. Um, and then the, then the cloister comes down there. And then there's a series of buildings over here. And then the precinct wall comes down there and alongside the Trill Mill stream, because the king said if they were going to build, if they were going to build across the wall, um, they needed to build a replacement wall. Um, so the Greyfriars built a sort of replacement town wall that went round, round the site. So that's a very exciting site rediscovered. And if you haven't seen it in the Westgate, if you go in there and look up, stuck on the wall in a very improbable position is part of the tile floor from the Greyfriars, um, Greyfriars Cloister. So we're almost there. The other thing we're plotting, of course, is colleges. And so many of the early colleges have gone. Um, some of them like Corpus are today pretty much like they were. Um, other ones like Exeter College have changed almost beyond recognition. Uh, the chapel of Exeter College is now here. The original front gate is standing as a tower, but all the rest of that range is gone and the medieval chapel has totally disappeared and the whole of the Broad Street end has been rebuilt. Um, so one has evidence from early plans and again from drawings of where college buildings were. And then on the outskirts, on the outside of Oxford, I've already talked about the open fields um, and the sort of pretty much a three field system operated in North Oxford. Um, so the park town is about there. Summer town is up here. Um, and that can be reconstructed in part because there's a St. John's College has not only got the field map, it has also got the enclosure map and it's got a crucial map that shows both. And although it's only very faintly shown on this, there is a map at St. John's that shows the medieval boundaries with the enclosure boundaries overlying it. And yes, we do finally get to the end. The final map that I was involved in was the map of the civil war defences, which was incredibly difficult to produce because although we have a um, Sir Bernard de Gom's plan of what was going to be on the defences, and although a lot of them are shown on Logan's map, and although we've dug up some of them, um, it's very difficult to plot what was there. And my colleagues at Oxford Archaeology kept on digging up extra bits. So the bit up here by the zoology lab, the Tinbergen building, um, only got in at the last minute. And there was another bit up there dug by Cotswold, which just missed it. And then there was a whole new series of ditches and things found at the Westgate which has changed our view of what's happening down there. Um, and note this map, I think, will rapidly become out of date as other bits are discovered. So that is, I'm sorry, that's a huge romp through far too much. Um, but that is some of the ways we look at towns and maps and produce the Atlas of Oxford. Thank you.